Good morning. Hey, so uh, just a couple of things. One, you saw that uh, shout out for the um, Harvest Festival, Fall Festival that we're partnering with. Echo Loader Elementary School is a uh, elementary school in an under-resourced part of Reno, super close to our Midtown campus. They've always done a uh, Fall Festival, but they never had enough volunteers, never had enough candy. Last year, we got to partner with them and said it was their best ever. We're stoked to partner with them again. And at Life Church, we're just all about being uh, engaged in our city, showing the love of Jesus. You can stop by guest services, sign up to help, super Super easy, a lot of fun. You'll be glad that you did. And also, hey, uh, we have our final men's encounter for this year coming up at the end of this month. And if you've never been, I encourage all of our men to go. I've been before, loved it. And so I encourage you to go as you go out today, just straight ahead. You can sign up. And about 65% of people that go, it's actually their wives that sign them up without them even knowing. It's a great early Father's Day gift, and so sign up your husband for Men's Encounter. You will be glad that you did. Hey, today we're continuing in our series that we're calling Unbelievable. Well, we're looking at some of the big questions that most people have. Some of these questions are, are questions that skeptics who, who might say, hey, I'd love to believe in God, I'd love to believe in Jesus, but I, I have these just questions that, I, these, that cause me to kind of have these hurdles to faith. And some of these questions also cause believers, people that know and love and follow Jesus, sometimes we wrestle with doubt because of some of these questions. And so we're just digging into these each week. And today... I want to talk to you about one of the biggest. Many people, when asked, why, why are you not a Christian? Many people say, the biggest reason is I think a lot of Christians are hypocrites. And so we're going to talk about this today. We're going to look at it from a few different sides, and, and I'm super excited about that. There was a survey done a number of years ago. There's a book. It's called Unchristian. It's by a guy named uh, Dave uh, Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. They wrote this book for Christians, but the book was talking about how, why, why do people reject faith, especially younger people? And so they did a survey of lots of people that claimed to be Christian and lots of people that didn't claim to be Christian. And they asked them about all of these different behaviors. And on this survey, they found that in, in these nine key areas, a handful of key areas, they found no or minimal statistics difference between people that said they were Christians and people that said they weren't Christians in terms of gambling, use of porn, stealing, gossip, going to psychics, fighting or physical abuse, illegal drugs, or lying or drinking beyond the legal limit. There was only one a category where there was a meaningful statistical difference between those that said they were Christians and those that said they weren't, and that was in recycling. Christians were 11% less likely to recycle than people that weren't Christians. And so, guys, y'all can help the stats as you leave today. Or you can, if there's a little white thing, you can recycle your worship guide. And then we're changing the perception of Christianity in the world together. together. And so... Uh, now, there are studies like that, and then there's other studies that dig a little deeper. And once you kind of, because we live in a country where between 75 and 83% of people claim to be some kind of Christian, and so sometimes these stats get kind of skewed. There's other studies where you kind of dig a little deeper into someone's uh, meaningful personal commitment and kind of the things that we would think would maybe define a more committed follower of Jesus, whether that be church attendance or engaging the scriptures or prayer. And at that point, you do begin to see kind of a more meaningful difference. But when those kind of stats go out there, people begin to say, man, is there any difference between Christians and non-Christians? And, and, or maybe someone personally knows a hypocrite, personally knows someone that says they love Jesus, but maybe they're just one of the meanest people in their life. And so they say, man, if that's what it is to be a Christian, I don't want to be one. And so maybe it's someone personally that you know, or, or maybe it's even stuff in the news. You know, even like in the 80s, there was the big televangelist scandal. More recently, all the stuff going on with priests and the Catholic Church and abuse stuff, it causes people to say, well, man, if that's what it is, I don't think I want to be one. And then also even stuff historically. People look at, at, at things uh, through history where, where Christians are blamed for, for things like the Crusades or the Inquisition or witch trials. They say, man, there's been all these bad things done in the name of Jesus. And so if that's what it is, I don't want to be one. And so today, I want us to look at this from a few different sides, and, and I think we're going to make some progress together. If you have your Bibles, go over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter... So good. Last service... The cheer wasn't very good. I thought maybe it was people that hadn't read their Bibles in a month, didn't want to be a hypocrite and cheer for the Bible. And so uh, Matthew chapter 7. So I, I think the biggest reason 
that we see so many people look and say, hey, that looks like, like that person um, isn't reflecting Jesus well. I, I think the biggest reason is that a lot of people that claim to be Christians just aren't really Christians. And, and so I think there's some people that aren't Christians and actually know it. We see this in Matthew 7, verse 15. We looked at this a few weeks ago in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Seems to me to speak that, that there are some people that are claiming to be Christians, they know full well they aren't. If they actually have a bad intent, Jesus said they're ravenous wolves. And, and so there's some people, and I think it's a pretty small group, some people that aren't Christians and actually know, but they say they're Christians, but by their behavior, they kind of add to this narrative of Christian hypocrisy. I think that's a pretty small group. I think a larger group is, is people that aren't Christians and don't know it. They think they're Christians, but, but, they, but they're not really what a faithful follower of Jesus actually is, but they just don't know it. Look here at verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, he's talking about the judgment. Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Jesus, didn't we do all this great stuff for you? Listed off a bunch of great stuff. Verse 23, and then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We looked at it a few weeks ago. It was a sobering uh, passage then. It's a sobering passage now. But, but it, Jesus seems to be saying there's some people who think they're Christians, but they're actually not. And now when, we, when you live in a place like America, where there's this kind of large, vast number of what I would call cultural Christians... People who, who just kind of were born in America, and they say, well, I'm not an atheist, and I'm not a Muslim, and I'm not a Jew. I guess I'm a Christian, and it's kind of this cultural Christianity. And so Jesus said that there's some people who, who aren't Christians, but they just don't know it. Uh, John Calvin said it this way. He said, the human heart has so many crannies where vanity hides, so many holes where falsehood lurks, is so decked out with deceiving hypocrisy that it often dupes itself. So sometimes we just end up fooling ourselves. We end up thinking that we are, but we're really not sobering thought. And so some of what looks like hypocrisy is people that aren't actually Christians. Some people aren't actually Christians and know it. Some people aren't actually faithful following, faithfully following Jesus and Christians, but don't know it. And then there's other stuff where, where, where kind of there's groups or individuals or specifically nations doing stuff in the name of Jesus that Jesus wants no part of. Uh, and, and the Ten Commandments, it says, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And we think that means like don't say GD and don't swear using God's name and definitely shouldn't do that. But what it's really saying is more than that. It's kind of like the idea of say, someone saying, I belong to God and I'm doing this in his name. But, but it, you really don't belong to God. Actually, God wants nothing to do with what you're doing. And, and so what we see, um, some of the things historically, things like the Crusades or the Inquisition or witch trials, some stuff where people say, man, well, Christians have done so much stuff in the name of God that's caught, hurt so many people. And, and I think a lot of that stuff, God's saying, hey, I wanted no part of that. And in fact, it gets a little bit more complex. Um, when you look at stuff like the Crusades and the Inquisition, what you see is you see nations who, who were, were kind of so much of that stuff was more political uh, than, it, uh, than it was religious. But what you see is uh, after Constantine, uh, the emperor, the Roman emperor, um, becomes a follower of uh, a Christian and, and then makes Christianity the state religion of Rome. At that point, the Roman Catholic Church was born. And so for over the next thousand years, more than a thousand years, there was like this, there wasn't a separation between the Roman Catholic Church and these European countries, right? And so these European countries would end up in disputes. Some of them, they were defending themselves. Some of them, it was a power grab. Some of them, it was a land grab. But because there was kind of this very strong tie between these European nations and, and the church, they would just kind of cloak a lot of what they did under this kind of umbrella of religion and so there was kind of it was all kind of mixed together and so you look at stuff like the crusades or the inquisition stuff that you say man these christians in the name of jesus did all these horrible things and there's no doubt there were people that claimed to be christians that were involved in all that but it was much more complex it was political it was power it was land there was all this different stuff going on and it's a it's a reason why our country why the founder said hey we we don't want to have a state church because whenever the church and the state have gotten too intertwined, it's been bad for both. And, and in fact, what you see is, um, 
kind of a, one thing that's unique about Christianity, uh, and it speaks a lot of great things about Christianity, but there is kind of this downside, is, is every other religion um, where the place where it has started, that has been where that, what has remained the center of that religion. And so uh, Islam is kind of the, the founded in the Middle East, and, and now there's more Muslims there than anywhere else. Now, now we live in a time where people uh, move and travel around the world, but the vast majority of Muslims are, are still in that kind of basic region of the world. People, uh, Buddhists, it was, Buddhism was, was kind of started over in Asia, and the vast majority of, of Buddhists are in Asia. Hinduism, the same. The vast majority majority and around where it was founded. But Christianity was uh, founded in the Middle East, spread to Europe, and then kind of spread to various parts of the world, North America uh, included, where kind of Christianity kind of took off and, 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 and really, really grew. And now we see it's thriving in Africa. Africa and China would probably be the two places today where Christianity is growing the fastest. Now, a couple of things about that. Well, I believe part of that is because the truth claims of Christianity go across all cultures. Part of that is because of the, the great mission efforts over, over the last 2,000 years. But the downside to that is what you see in Christianity is it will go into a place, it will take root among the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized and those on the fringes. And then what happens is, is as Christianity becomes more powerful and then ends up kind of linked more with the government, and inevitably, and what we saw in Europe over hundreds and hundreds of years, is the actual number of committed followers of Jesus, what we'd call faithful followers of Jesus, shrinks while the number of cultural Christians, people who say, well, hey, I was born in Spain. I guess I'm a Catholic. I was born in England. I guess I'm Church of England. And this kind of cultural Christianity comes up while the number of committed followers of Jesus comes down. And ultimately, you see Christianity go into decline and the center of it kind of into a new area among the poor, the marginalized people like in China where, where they, they worship at their own risk in these house churches. And, and so when we look and we say, hey, there's been these various atrocities kind of committed in the name of Jesus, stuff like the Crusades and the Inquisition. Position. It's a little more complex, and many times it was political, it was land grabs, it was really more nations than it was. It really wasn't real committed followers of Jesus. It's the sort of thing where Jesus would look at it and say, hey, I wanted no part of that. And so sometimes it gets complex. Some of that stuff's actually a little bit overhyped. People that say, well, well, hey, religion causes war, Christi terrible things have been done in the name of Christianity, so I don't want anything to do with it. And they focus on things like the, the Crusades, the Inquisition, witch trials, stuff that took place over about a 500-year period. And some historians have done their best to kind of go and, and look at how many people actually died um, in, in those kind of holy wars, crusades, inquisition, et cetera. And obviously, if, if one person died, it's, it's too many. But, but best guess is over that 500-year period, about 250,000 people uh, may, may have died as a result of, of kind of these wars that were done in the name of Jesus, even though it was far more political than that. And, and so some would say, well, hey, I want no part of that. Religion causes war. Christianity's done these terrible things. But if you look at the 100-year period of time in the last century, 100-year period of time, and then you look at the wars that were actually started by, by atheists and, 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 and Marxists, uh, let me list you some of this. Hitler, Hitler killed about 6 million Jews and gypsies and homosexuals. The, the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia killed about 2 million of their own people. These are atheists. These are Marxists. Stalin killed about 20 million through, through mass slayings and labor camps. Mao in China exterminated uh, about 50 or 70 million. So over a 100-year period, you see over 100 million. Uh, that doesn't excuse the 250,000, and that was obviously not great, and it's the danger of kind of a, a, a church-state link. Is then the, as then the, the church ends up taking the blame for stuff that much, much have been the state. But over a 100-year period, in the name of atheism, in the name of, of Marxism, you see about 100 million die. So the, the idea that war is all rooted in religion and that war is, is all rooted in Christianity, much of this has been overplayed. Here's the next thing. Uh, I think that some people look and say, hey, I, I, I can't follow Jesus because of hypocrites. Sometimes it's just a misunderstanding. Uh, between what is Christianity and what is hypocrisy. See, some people uh, look and they think, well, well, Christianity is all about being a good person. And obviously, we do want to become more like Jesus, but, but Jesus didn't come to, uh, to, to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. 
that's not an original quote with me. I'm not sure who it is. We'll just give, it, give credit to Jesus. Uh, um, and, and so that's not what it is. The, the reality is that Christianity is all about Jesus coming for flawed, imperfect, broken, sinful people. But people that, that aren't Christians, you wouldn't expect them to know what the, the kind of the whole idea of Christianity is. And so if someone's expectation of what it is to be Christian is for that person to be perfect and to, and to fully live out the, the ideals of, of, of Jesus, that that is that we recognize that that we are imperfect and that's why Jesus came and, and so sometimes it's a misunderstanding of what is Christianity sometimes it, it's a, a misunderstanding of what is hypocrisy Jesus lived a perfect life because we can't do it but sometimes uh, people think that 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 hypocrisy is simply the absence of perfection go over to Romans chapter 7 let me show you this to you sometimes it's it's simply a struggle the Christians, this side of heaven, aren't going to be perfect. There's going to be a time that uh, when, you, when you begin to be a follower of Jesus, you begin this process where God's making you more like Jesus, but we don't fully end up like Jesus and perfect until we're with him. And so this whole life is a process. And so the Apostle Paul here in Romans 7, verse 15, kind of lets us see a little glimpse of his own struggles. Paul says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Have you ever felt like that? Man, I want to do the right thing, but I just not. I don't want to do the wrong thing, but I keep doing the wrong thing. It's like Paul's writing his journal here saying, man, I, I really want to do the right thing. It's, that's not the words of a hypocrite. It's the words of someone who really hates his sin, wants to do the right thing, but it struggles. It's the, it, this is the normal experience of every Christian that, that, that we say, hey, there's some thing. I, man, I want to always do the right thing, but I don't always do the right thing. And I, I don't want to do the wrong thing, but sometimes I do the wrong thing. And it's this struggle. But if someone doesn't understand that this is the nature of, of what it is to be a Christian and that it's a process and a journey, someone could look at that and say, man they're, just, they, man, they're just a hypocrite. And Paul says, man, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm just struggling. Man, I, I really, I, I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep doing this. He said, I don't do the good I want, but the evil I, I do not want is what I keep on doing. And it's just an honest struggle. He says, man, I hate what I'm doing and, and I'm trying to stop and I'm asking God to help me, but sometimes I just mess up. It's not the absence, hypocrisy is not the absence of perfection. Sometimes what looks like hypocrisy loses sight of real progress. Uh, maybe you're with someone that says they're a Christian, right? They say they're a Christian, you don't know them that well. You don't know them that well and you're with them and, and you're with them for an hour and over that hour they drop three F-bombs. I know you don't know what an F-bomb is because you're so holy, you don't know what that is, such good Christians, <laughs> congratulations. And you're with them and you're like, man, I thought they were a Christian. But in the last hour, they've dropped three F-bombs. They must be a hypocrite. But the reality is you just don't know them very well. You don't know that had you been with them a year ago for an hour, they might have dropped 12 F-bombs <laughs> or 112. And, and sometimes you look at somebody that you don't know very well and you see how far they have to go. And so someone that doesn't maybe understand Christianity very well or someone that doesn't understand hypocrisy very well looks at a Christian at a snapshot of time and says well man if that's what it's to be a Christian I don't want to be one and all they're seeing is how far that person has to go to really live up to the Jesus life and they don't recognize how far they've come and so sometimes what looks like hypocrisy doesn't recognize just how much progress has already come how much God has already done in their life here's the next thing I think people reject Christianity because of hypocrisy because we all pick and choose our favorite parts. Go over to Matthew 23. Let me show this to you. I think of all the, the legitimate claims where people look and say, hey, man, those Christians, they seem like hypocrites. I think this is probably the most legitimate source where Christians just pick and choose the parts of following Jesus they're going to take seriously. Some of that, I think, is rooted in our personalities and our wiring. 
We all know that, that as followers of Jesus, we should tell other people about Jesus. Now, if you're this great extrovert, that's super, that's going to be easier for you. You get on an airplane and he's like, you're like, who's going to sit next to me? I'm fixing to tell him about Jesus. And if, and, and if you're, like an, you're like an introvert, you are thinking, you sit in that plane and you're thinking, I'm going to get these Bose headphones on before anyone sits next to me so I can say nothing to them. And it's just, you've just got different personalities. And so some of it is our personalities kind of lead us to kind of embrace parts of what it is of following Jesus and kind of ignore other parts of what it is. I think sometimes it's the culture, uh, the broader culture that we've grown up in. And so some stuff just caught culturally, it just kind of fits us better. And so we're like, hey, I'm going to embrace this part I'm going to leave this part some of it is the kind of church culture and the kind of teaching and preaching we've sat under for a a long time kind of leads us to kind of prioritize this and de-emphasize this but we all let me show you this look at Matthew 23 23 23 here's what Jesus says he says woe to you scribes and Pharisees now that Jesus is always bashing on the religious people it's easy for us to read this and think those guys were idiots those guys were evil and I'm glad I'm not those guys but the reality is Man, we are at church on Sunday. We are, maybe we are a little bit of those guys. Maybe he's talking to us a little bit. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You tithe your mint and dill and cumin. So these people, they, they were tithing off their money. They're giving to the temple their money and their crops, their animals, and they're even giving their spices. Listen, nobody put any cinnamon in the offering basket. No cinnamon in the basket. And so they're tithing off their spices, like down to like, oh, here's here's 10% of my cinnamon. It's ridiculous. And so so Jesus says, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice. He says, man, there's people being taken advantage of and you don't care. You're off tithing your cinnamon. And mercy. Man, there's people in great need and you don't care. You're off tithing your nutmeg and faithfulness he says these things you ought to have done you should have cared about those being oppressed and the poor you should have been faithful and yeah it's great to be generous and to give and so keep doing that without neglecting the others and so here's what here's what they're doing they're picking and choosing the parts of of obeying god that they want to and we all fall into this and i think it's probably the most legitimate reason why some people look and say man they they say they're christians but man look at all this stuff they don't seem to care much about and so it can happen in so many ways. It, you could say, hey, I'm going to never miss church, but I'm just going to keep walking in unforgiveness with that family member. You don't get to do that. You don't get to pick and choose. So I'm going to fight against abortion, but I'm going to disregard the poor. I'm going to be super generous, but, but I'm going to totally ignore the, the Christian sexual ethic. I don't want, I'm going to do what I want to do when it comes to sex. I'll never use profanity, but, but I, I'm going to regularly gossip and criticize. We all have this tendency to find the parts of following Jesus and obeying the scripture that, that we like and kind of ignore the other parts. There's, this, uh, there's a thing called syncretism. Uh, let me explain it to you. And so if you think of a place like Haiti, uh, uh, and a place like Haiti has a history of like tribal religions, animism, weird voodoo stuff, right? And, and so Christian missionaries come into a place like Haiti to tell people about Jesus. The Haitians are like, man, Jesus sounds awesome. I am going to follow Jesus. But they kind of still keep some of their weird voodoo stuff. So now you got weird voodoo Jesus, right? And, and so it's, it's called syncretism, where you kind of take a little bit of this religion and a little bit of that religion and a little bit of this religion, and it's called it's kind of a little mix mash. It honestly is the number one religion in America. Where people say, hey, I'm gonna, I, man, I'm going to take some of Jesus, some of the American way, some of my personal preferences, throw in a little bit of Oprah, and now I've made my own religion. <laughs> and so that's why people say, man, those Christians say that they follow Jesus, but, but man, Jesus was into this, and they don't seem so much into this. I think I'm going to write off the whole thing. It's because we all, all of us, Every one of us pick and choose our favorite parts. And so if we're going to faithfully follow Jesus, we're going to say, Jesus, would you show me these parts of following you that maybe are in my blind spot? Maybe I've not taken seriously and and, and that we would, would submit fully to the authority of Jesus, the authority of scripture, not just in our favorite parts that we like, but in every area, even if it causes us to change and to stretch and to grow. I think that is the most legitimate reason 
why some, I think some of the accusations of hypocrisy are overblown. I think some of it's just misunderstanding and, and having expectations that aren't fair, but I think this is a legitimate critique because all of us lose sight of our own hypocrisy. People love to spot a hypocrite because it makes them feel better about themselves. And, and we lose sight of our, look at Matthew 23, verse 25. Let me show this to you. Now, here's the thing. Whether you're a Christian or not, I mean, everyone's got some hypocrisy. Whether you say, I'm not a Christian, I, I guess I can't be a hypocrite. The reality is every person, Christian or not, has a set of ideals that they do not fully live up to. Everyone's got some of that. And let me show you here. Matthew 23, verse 25. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate. But inside, if any, anyone here that's got like an 11-year-old who you task with like doing your dishwasher, loading your dishwasher and unloading your dishwasher, you've had the experience, you go to the, the cupboard, you pull out the coffee cup, coffee cup looks great on the outside, you pull it out, and there's all kinds of nasty in the coffee cup, right? And you'll say to your kid, do you not look at these dishes when you put them? Have you had this experience? Do you guys have children that you utilize as free labor? Yeah, that experience? And, and so G Jesus is saying, you're like, do you not look at this? Do you not rinse anything out? And, like, I learned it from you, Dad. And so, uh, um, so uh, he says, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're all dirty. He says, it matters more that the inside of the cup, that's what matters, not the outside. He says, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, and the outside will also be clean. He says, woe to you. If you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. You also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawless. So a primary mark of a hypocrite is they care more what they look like on the outside to people than what they look like on the inside to God. It's a primary mark of a hypocrite. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So what's Jesus saying? So the Old Testament is filled with stories of prophets from God that people, at least for a while, reject, sometimes killed them. And so these, these uh, hypocrites, these religious leaders are saying, you know what, man, if, if that was us three, four, five, six, seven hundred thousand years ago and those prophets came, man, we would have just obeyed God. We would have gotten right with God. There's no way we would have rejected them. And so what hypocrites do is, is they, they overestimate their own goodness and, and then they overestimate everyone else's wickedness. They underestimate the goodness of others. And so they're like, hey, man, our fathers, our forefathers, man, man, they did all this bad stuff. We never, ever, ever would have done that. Now, these are the same people that in about a month and a half are going to kill the Son of God. They're actually worse than their forefathers. Who, who, and so, but they, they saw themselves as awesome and everyone else as terrible. That's what hypocrites do. But we lose sight of our own hypocrisy. We see the, the mess-ups of others. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, this year or this month or more likely this very day, we have failed to practice ourselves the kind of behavior we expect from other people. Let me read you a quote from the great theologian Robin Williams. Let me read this to you. <laughs> For me, comedy starts as a spew, a kind of explosion, and then you sculpt it from there, if at all. It comes out of a deeper, darker side. Maybe it comes from anger because I'm outraged by cruel absurdities. The hypocrisy that exists everywhere, even within yourself, where it's hardest to see. So when you start to think about, maybe you kind of look at, honestly, sometimes I look at this dumb stuff Christians say. Sometimes I feel like there's like five Christians that should be allowed to speak on the news and everyone else should have to shut up. You know what I'm saying? Just stupid stuff Christians say. And, and I'm like, man, would you just shut up and not stop making us all look bad? And, and instead of what, what I got to do is instead of looking at their screw-ups, their hypocrisy, I need to look at mine. You don't have to amen that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Dave, look at your hypocrisy. And so, uh, um, so it's, I'm going to believe you're talking about your hypocrisy. And so... Uh, <laughs> Last point, we're done. Because we, uh, I think that it's so easy to end up looking too much at the reflection and too little on the original. And so maybe, maybe you're wrestling with faith in light 
of hypocrisy, or, or maybe you've got a friend that's talking to you about this, or, or, or maybe you're a follower of Jesus, but you do just sometimes get discouraged by, by kind of some things attributed to, to Christians or, or Christianity. And not to excuse actual hypocrisy. And we all need to, all need to do better. We all need to, to not pick and choose so much. And, uh, but, but the fact is, there's a sense in which the fact that I imperfectly represent Jesus, the fact that you imperfectly represent Jesus, the fact that every Christian ha- has failed to perfectly represent Jesus, in some ways it speaks of us and how we could do better, but in some ways it just speaks of how amazing Jesus is. And so sometimes our tendency is, as, as Christians, we're kind of, we're reflections of Jesus, but we're imperfect reflections of Jesus. And, and, and so it's easy to kind of look at these imperfect reflections of Jesus and, and to get discouraged and to, and to think, man, why is it this way? And it gets, how does that speak of Jesus? But, but really the fact that, 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 that so many of us cannot live up to the perfection of Jesus it, it is a testimony to the wonder and amazingness of Jesus. And so instead of looking at these imperfect reflections, look to the perfect original and ask the question and, and say, man, who is Jesus? And what did he do? And what does his death and resurrection mean? And what did he teach? And look a lot more at the perfect original and a lot less at the imperfect reflection because people will let you down. And the fact that that Christians don't live out the ideals of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus perfectly, it does not invalidate the truth of who Jesus is. It does not invalidate the truth of what Jesus taught. Is, uh, here's what Leo Tolstoy once said. Attack me rather than the path I follow and which I point out to anyone who asks me where I think it lies. If I know the way home and I'm walking along it drunkenly, is it any less the right way because I'm staggering from side to side? And the fact that Christians aren't perfect and living out the life of Jesus. It, it, had, it, it does not at all take away the truth of the message of Jesus, who he is and what he's done. It, it, it only, it speaks to us. And some of it's just a misunderstanding. Some of it's people doing stuff in the name of Jesus that didn't know Jesus. Some of it's, it's, it's nations doing stuff in the name of Jesus. Here's the truth. Nations can't be Christian. Individuals can be Christian. And there could be nations that have a lot of individual Christians. And, and, and there's nations that live out a Christian ideal better than others, but there's no such thing as a Christian nation. There are Christian individuals that live in those nations, but then these nations that take on this label that say, man, we're, we're a Christian nation, and then they commit atrocities. And it, it's, it confuses, and it causes, it causes people to misjudge and misinterpret. And, and, and then sometimes it's honestly just people that honestly love Jesus that are just struggling because we haven't arrived yet. A lot of times it's, it's, we find ourselves picking and choosing and we've got to be better at that. We've got to say whether it's our, our morals or our money or our politics, what, whatever it is, we've, we've got to lay it in front of Jesus and say, Jesus, we're, we're, we want to obey you in every area, not just in our favorite spots. And we're going to ignore the stuff that we like less. But all of us, whether, whether we're skeptics or whether we're followers of Jesus, we would all just do better to look more at Jesus and who he is, his death, his resurrection, and what he taught. Look more at Jesus and less at his imperfect children. Let me pray for you. You know, I think if, as Christians, if we're ever, anyone ever brings this up to us, you know, before we try to explain about the potential misunderstandings or potential of any of that, the first thing we ought to do is just be humble. Just say, you know what? And you're right, man. There's never been a Christian who has perfectly reflected Jesus, and I don't, and no one ever has. And sometimes it's gone way bad. And a humble apology and a humble ownership is the first best thing. And then to kind of engage in some of this other stuff. But let me pray for you. So God, God, we thank you that our following you is not based on our perfection, but is based on yours. 
And God, I want to pray for, for maybe skeptics, people that aren't sure what they think about you or about Christianity. And part of the challenge is, man, Christians haven't represented you well in their lives. And, and God, where that's brought great hurt. God, I pray just help them to know that wasn't you. That's not your heart towards them. God, I pray that you'd reveal that even though your, your children, th those that really are your children and, and others, God, have, have represented you poorly, God, that you really are good and that you're a good God and that you love them. God, I pray you'd reveal yourself to them. And God, for, for all of us, God, I pray you'd help us just to keep our eyes more on you the perfect original than any of us who are just imperfect reflections. God, I pray that you would, for those of us that are your followers, God, that we would, wouldn't pick and choose the parts of obeying you that are gonna, we're going to take seriously. So God, we invite you to show us in each of our lives our blind spots, the things that we haven't taken seriously, the things you want to grow us in. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. When you come up to Men's Encounter and come up on a Friday and go home on a Sunday, you spend 48 hours uh, just seeking God. For some of some people, for the first time in their life, they actually spend just 48 hours focused on Him, put their phones away, put their iPads away. It's for new believers, it's for unbelievers, it's for people that are very mature in their walk. I mean, there's a little bit of everything in there because it's really not, uh, it, you know, it's an opportunity to encounter God. And God's got a different plan for each one of us and it's unique and it's very personalized. I was very leery about coming up here uh, before, um, before I actually came. And when I came, my experience was that these were men that were fully devoted to God, but had also gotten a revelation of who God was in their lives. What makes this different is that the guys serving and the guys leading are just normal, ordinary men with normal, ordinary problems. And what we find is that we're all cut from the same cloth. Nobody's telling us what to do or what to think. They're just posting questions. People are giving testimonies and telling stories about their personal experiences. And that might just touch a, a bring up a memory for me or touch an area of my life where I might have some hurt or some pain or I might want to uh, do some growing not a bunch of preaching and pastors up on the pulpit pounding the word into you. It's about real men, real stories, getting real raw. He healed areas in my life that I didn't even know uh, were wounded, that I didn't even know were incomplete, um, and set me on a path to fully rely on Christ as my Lord and Savior. I say get on the bus and your life will change. And I say that because the 10 days before you get on the bus, every voice in your head is telling you something different. Every voice in your head is telling you not to get on that bus. It's telling you, you don't need this. You're good where you're at. It's a total changing of my heart. Now I'm, uh, I'm not uh, doing religion anymore. Now I'm serving God's kingdom. And every day I'm looking for ways that I can give Him glory. You know, my experience with guys up here, when they get back down on Monday, it's how much they've changed. It's incredible to see what God can do if you just give Him the time and the space to operate in your life. I want every man I know, every man I don't know, to come and encounter this because I believe that it's spiritually transformational. And I get to witness miracles on these holy grounds. And that's pretty cool.